Echoes of Wisdom is right around the corner. So what I thought I would do today is go back to Link's Awakening and do a full speedrun explain because a lot of cool glitches have been discovered in just the past two years. And since the two games will share the same engine, I wanted to break down this game to hopefully give you a tease into what possibly could be happening when Echoes of Wisdom launches. So that being said, let's get into the speedrun. Let's start this in three, two, one, and go. All right, so starting off immediately, the early game is pretty straightforward. We're gonna go and pick up a couple of starting items that we need. However, what you might not have noticed is that when I started that timer and opened up that specific file, our first trick has already happened because this game sets an RNG seed or a luck-based seed that will determine multiple events throughout the game, like certain puzzle orders and the final combination to a puzzle at the end of the game. And that stays throughout the whole thing. So by starting a game at a very specific specific time from boot up, you can guarantee to have certain RNG outcomes later on. But either way, what we're going to be doing after that is like I said, pretty straightforward. We're going to run down here to the beach and we're going to pick up the sword. After picking up the sword, I'm going to do a short little animation skip right there by actually using my shield in the middle of him showing off the sword for the first time, just to save a couple of seconds. After this, I'm going to summarize this first part here. We're going to run over to pick up a mushroom in the forest, turn it into magic powder through the witch. After getting the witch, we're going to turn this random raccoon into Mario. If this is the first time you're actually getting to see Link's Awakening, you kind of just want to check this video out before it goes to wisdom. This game has a lot of unique characters that's not seen for the rest of the Zelda franchise. So you will see a couple of Mario characters. You have Goombas in the game, Chain Chomp, stuff like that. It's a very, very charming game. If you haven't played it, I really do recommend it. But yeah, once we got in the key now, I'm going to be running down here to the first dungeon. And this is going to be what I like to call like the last calm part because once we have completed the first dungeon and we get our first item the jump mechanic we're gonna absolutely be breaking the order of this game very quickly all right, and here's the first dungeon. Now, thankfully in this first dungeon, most of the items that are scattered around here are completely optional. You only need one small key here to run straight away to go and get the feather. This is, you know, like your practice tutorial dungeon like every other Zelda game has. So not too much going on, pretty straightforward. Once we get up to the top left here, I'm going to stun these two guys, gonna throw some magic powder to insta-kill them. It just saves a little bit of time instead of having to use the sword. And then we can run over here. And here's our first Goombas. Hello. And once we get up here now, this is one of the coolest items in any game. Not for the glitches, even as a casual. I will stand by that the feather is one of the most awesome, greatest items of any game. I love being able to jump in Zelda games. You're also going to see something very cool here, which is that this game uses one of the best saving systems of all time. So right there, I didn't have to do like a saving quit because anytime you get any sort of important item, it always auto saves. So I just super quickly right there clicked on load file and shows the last one and you're immediately spawned back to the beginning. So you don't have to go through like anything special whatsoever. Okay, we're gonna go back to the main room. And now once we have the jumping mechanic, I'm going to go up here and pick up the boss key. And that's literally it. That's the entire dungeon. Even though early game is never that fun for a Zelda speedrun specifically. Thankfully in this game, it's only about 10 minutes long, which all things considered isn't that bad. Now, when it comes to the combat in this game, one very important thing is gonna try and be stun locking. And the game really does try and avoid it. But if you time it perfectly and you do it right as the vulnerability frame ends you can like get most enemies just stuck in corners so like right there that might look like i was just slashing my sword but trust me i was trying to time it there so you can do some really cool strats with the bosses here and now we're coming up on our first dungeon boss this is the boss i like to call hamburger with lettuce maybe not the tastiest burger by any means but it's all good another thing that a lot of people might not actually know when it comes to quick spinning in this game it's super overpowered because not only only does quick spinning perform double damage. But because Link starts his spin on the, his side, if you angle yourself to an enemy, you can actually get two hits with one quick spin, meaning that you can basically get a quad damage output, if that makes sense, which is how you can, for example, right there, two cycle that first dungeon boss without any basically glitches whatsoever, just very clever design. And that is one out of eight instruments. Now, First dungeon is complete, and the expected route that you would imagine me taking is about to completely be over. So, 
if you play this game casually, you will know that right now for the first dungeon, I'm supposed to do my first kind of side quest or side adventure, whatever you want to call it. And in this case, I have to go and rescue Bow Wow. He's a beautiful chain chomp and he's been stolen and everyone is panicked because Bow Wow was taken. Fortunately, Bow Wow is not going to be saved. Instead, we are going to be working with this rooster here. So I'm going to bring this rooster over here and I'm going to throw him over this gap. Now I'm going to go up in this corner and walk upright twice. And if I did this correctly, what's going to happen is the rooster is going to be over my head. I'm going to get eaten by the like like. And when you get eaten by a like like, he spits you straight up. But since the rooster is on top of the sign above me, he angles the projection. So instead of going straight up, I go up to the left because I cannot be going into, you know, the rooster's collision. And that puts me on top of these trees out of bounds. Now I have to do this precise jump right here to jump over that gap. And now I can control continuously be walking out of bounds. Now, hopefully I don't fall down here. Most of these have invisible walls that are quite tall. So I just have to follow along here and jump and just try not to fall down. And if I do that correctly, I can land on top of those spikes, go into the second dungeon and completely skip all the additional quests related to rescuing Bow Wow. And this is, by the way, why I'm so excited for Echoes of Wisdom, because the collision checks and the physics engine in Link's Awakening is one of the most interesting ones that I've ever seen in a 2D game, because it's not truly a 2D game. It's an actual 3D engine, but played in the perspective of 2D. And let's just say what you're going to notice later on when I do some of the more crazy glitches is that them trying to make physics work with layers, right? You know, being able to be on a higher platform, lower platform, and screen transitions, etc. had some strange consequences when trying to make the whole thing work of deciding, you know, what layer you're on in a 3D engine treat it as a 2d game all right here you're going to notice another major kind of mechanic when it comes to combat so normally when you slash this guy a lot of enemies that are supposed to be harder the way that the developers made it harder is actually really interesting by increasing the recoil that you get from slashing your sword on them so by slashing your sword you get recoiled so far back you can't do a second slash however that recoil is heavily reduced if you're in the middle of the air so right there if you just jump you can get two to three hits in per jump instead of just one before you go way too far back and that's what i do right there to super cool get take down the mini boss and go up here now this is when the route is going to start to turn very different from what you would expect so i'm going to pick up this power bracelet and once i have this now i'm going to load my save and leave the dungeon so this is a half completed dungeon now and we're going to come back to it the main thing that we want to do right now and why we're splitting this dungeon up is because i'm sure you can know is something this right here where you're watching is slow and that's because we don't have the running boots and that's what we want to try and hurry up and get as quickly as possible so we're going to try and do some glitches to break the order of these dungeons to get this item early so the first thing i do though want to get is a couple of items unfortunately i am broke so i'm going to have to steal some of these items so by making him look away and then going behind his back you're going to be able to steal an item now the next time you walk inside after you steal an item him he's not going to be too pleased with you and um he's going to get his revenge but <laughs> even though we do get a game over it is still way faster than obtaining the necessary items to buy all the items so we're gonna go down here go up here leave and now we got both the shovel and the bow and arrow now at this point i have all the items from the shop that i need and we are ready to start breaking the game so i'm going to activate this quick warp for later and then perform a manual save because we're coming up in a major glitch right here do you see these guys that have come out right here like this certain enemies cannot be killed with a magic powder instead it stuns you so you can like move them around like this so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna make both of them come out stun both of them and then i'm gonna throw jump and attack at the same time which will make him be kind of angled like this then if you walk against him you will respawn on top of his back in the air if i line it up correctly when i jump i will land on the trees because he was angled like this then you can walk along these trees and then do a very precise jump here to land across this gap and that jump is very difficult trust me after that though i can walk on top of these plants jump down here and immediately get the key to enter the third dungeon. If you play the game casually, you know this was be another massive quest to get this. Normally, you'd have to go to a castle, get a bunch of gold feathers, etc., etc. So being able to get in here early is very essential for the speedrun to work. As many of you know, I love Manscaped. 
So I'm super excited to announce their latest masterpiece, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra Forged Gold Edition. Now, if you're not aware, the Lawnmower 5.0 is my favorite trimmer on the market. And with this beautiful limited edition gold version, it makes it even better. But what makes it so good? Well, it comes with all the great benefits of the 5.0, which is a great battery life, a beautiful sleek design, an LED light, and this amazing case for storing and traveling with. But what sets it above the competition is the addition of its interchangeable blades. You can either use it like it comes with its dual blade, which gives you a perfect trim, or you can swap it to the foil blade, which hands down gives you the most clean shave. Like, no joke, it is literally what I use exclusively to shave with. So if you think I have a clean shave, then you will not be disappointed. So if you want to check out this beautiful gold edition with all the benefits of the 5.0 already included, then be sure to go to manscaped.com slash Linka7 or use promo code Linka7 because that will get you 20% off your order plus free shipping. So what are you waiting for? Check out the gold edition right now while it's still available and use my code to get a great deal while shopping. Thank you so much manscape for sponsoring this video now once we're in this dungeon before we even go into it at all i actually need to get a couple of bombs so i'm going to farm bombs here thankfully it's super fast because the first pots here have guaranteed four bomb drops so by going in and out i can get eight which should be all the bombs i need and right there after getting the eight bombs i'm gonna go up now this dungeon is one of the only dungeons that, in my opinion, have one of the weirdest layouts. It has a lot of optional rooms. And what I mean by that is there are many sections of this dungeon which needs a key. And if you use the key, the only item you get back is another small key. So it's kind of a troll dungeon where you can be really fast and get through it and basically skip one third of the dungeon without ever having to do anything. Or you have to go through every single room. It depends on the order. If you ever want to do this dungeon quickly and skip the option, Optional rooms just go right here and you can get to the end basically either way here we're gonna kill these enemies get the small key and this is gonna be the only small key i need throughout this dungeon because we're coming up on one of the main mechanics of this game that is extremely broken this is a 3d game like i mentioned in a 2d engine meaning that the game has to at some point try and determine what layer i'm on so it needs to know am i on an upper layer like i'm on right now or am i at the bottom and these ledges that, you know, like, I'll show you right now, you know, you jump down here, right? These ledges can get quite broken. And the game will do its best if you get in between these kind of collisions of being in an upper ledge and a bottom ledge to decide where to put you. And we can abuse that to our advantage. So right here, I'm going to try and get in a very specific spot by doing a home buffer. And if you do that correctly, what I'm going to do now is drop a bomb, pick it up, and I'm going to try and walk off. And if I did it correctly, I will be basically in the middle of the transition of an upper floor and a bottom floor. So if I jump off right now, you're going to see that Link is going to be floating. And now you can see that the game is trying to decide where to put Link. Because it is trying to put Link at the closest valid collision. You can see that I'm just floating around right now. And this is basically me being on top of this transitional layer, trying to decide where to put me. And because I'm holding left, it's trying to slowly correct Link's position by putting me here on the left where the valid collision is. Thankfully, even though this is valid collision that it took me to, you might be able to see that it's on top of a wall that I'm not supposed to be on. So this allows me to walk all the way around and then jump on top of this chest, open it up, and immediately get the Pegasus boots, skipping a huge chunk of the dungeon. Once I have these boots now, I'm going to be able to break even more things because trust me, jumping with Pegasus boots is busted. So we're going to run up here and we're going to pick up the boss key. Now, normally here, you would need four small keys to get access to the basement, which is where the final part of the dungeon is. But you can actually repeat this glitch I just performed and get over to there once you have the Pegasus boots and the big key. So I'm going to re-perform the same setup here. Then I'm going to jump off here, turn around. Okay. And now we're back out of bounds. And then I'm going to run over here where I was just at. And now I'm going to try and jump on top of the chest. 
then jump on top of these invisible walls here, jump down and skip the three other small keys. And that skips the entirety of the dungeon. Because now I'm at the bottom of the basement and this is basically just where you have the boss door and the boss itself. That should just give you a glimpse into the out of bounds madness that is Link's Awakening. Then why as a speedrunner, I am so excited about Echoes of Wisdom because this is already a broken engine and then you add on top of it being able to spawn objects anywhere and I think we're in for a good time. Right here, there's also a quick strat here to killing this boss. If I jump and charge up a running animation while being in the air, he doesn't have time to move again, so I can just one cycle him like super quickly because running with your sword with the Pegasus boots also performs higher forms of damage. I'm gonna pick up the heart. I'm actually gonna be picking up all the heart containers. Unlike other speedruns where even like, you know, a world record might skip them, but new runners might pick up hearts. In this run, even competitive times, like the world record gets additional heart containers because because the final dungeons and bosses of this game are really hard. All right. Now, once I got the Pegasus boots, I'm going to go and unlock something for later. There's a quick warp you can unlock here by the Shell House. I don't actually need to ever go to the Shell House, but this is close to both dungeon four and five. So I want to make sure that I have this unlocked. And while I have this unlocked as well, I can warp back to the village. Then once I'm back here, I now want to progress a couple of things towards dungeon four. So I'm going to go over back to the village and enter this kind of sleeping chamber. Thankfully, the short side quest before like dungeon four here is super fast. So by going to sleep here, a little bit of an inception moment, this should have a lot of rupees and they should also have the ocarina, which can be used for playing songs, which is important to beat in the game, as well as fast travel, among many other things. I'm gonna go up to this chest. Gonna get a hundred rupees. And there's the ocarina. You also see me, by the way, slashing my sword a lot as I'm doing these running sequences. And that's just because I don't want to bonk because bonking is really slow. So it's just a quick way to kind of like interrupt your movement midway through. But yeah. Now, once we're going to be heading over back to dungeon two to finally beat the dungeon, we're coming up on another exploit. And this is another kind of a height one. And this one is related to staircases. So this is basically how the glitch works. If you take a look right here. So you can see right now that I'm climbing in the middle of the air. So by doing a slash off the top of the staircase when we should be doing the animation of climbing down and then interrupting that and turning around and climbing it back up at the very top, the way you can imagine it is that the game basically extends the ladder invisibly above the normal staircase so I can climb in the air above it. And this allows me to jump to many out of bounds areas. So in this case, I'm climbing it to get on top of these trees and this is just some really really fast out of bounds movement. This is technically an optional one, but it just makes the movement so good looking to get back to dungeon two. And now once I'm here, I'm finally ready to beat the dungeon. And then we're gonna go up here and that's all we need. We got that one small key from earlier and I'm able to skip the rest of the dungeon thanks to having Pegasus boots. So I can head straight to the boss room with just the boss key now. Now getting Pegasus boots to go through this dungeon faster is not the only reason we wanted it. The real reason is because there is a glitch to clip out of bounds during this boss fight, which skips the boss fight. And this is one of the slowest fights in the whole game, but it requires the Pegasus boots. So once this fight starts, I have to make sure to never walk up or down because I have to manipulate this guy to move into a very certain position. So I'm only allowed to walk left and right. If I walk up or down, it's gonna mess up the positioning. And then I'm not gonna be able to talk through this because the setup is so fast, but I'm gonna try and basically do this if you look at this. Got it. So what I did right there is I manipulated him to get at a very certain position. And what it let me do is bonk into him and recoil through the door. Once you do that, when you walk back in, because the game has already played the animation of starting the boss fight once, it will not replay it. So let us walk to the left room and get what we now would be our third instrument out of eight. Now I'm officially ready to enter dungeon four. This is one of the longest dungeons to get access to, and we do not want to take the time to do that. This is where you put the key in right there. You see the little keyhole and it would turn off the waterfall. You have to go up to the top, turn off the water. You have to go down here. You have to have a key. And it's just a whole process to go in many different places to get access to it. But what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and do an air climb and then ride the invisible walls above. Because you can see here, this collision here, there's a lower part here on the left. Left, and then there's this upraised part here and they have different heights in terms of their invisible walls above.
So I'm going to try and ride alongside this top invisible wall here. And then go down here. Okay. So now I'm past the tall invisible wall on the white part. And I'm now very carefully walking on the floor here that is in between the two barriers. And if I get this jump right now... Yes, okay. I can jump into the corner of the waterfall, clip through without landing on the water, and that skips the entire side quest of normally getting access to the fourth dungeon. Now, once I'm in here, this is another long dungeon, but once again, out of bounds is crazy. Here we're on a new example. Here, we have a floor here and a floor here. Thankfully, we can outsmart Nintendo. You normally can't run and jump, which gives you a lot of height, and kind of get around like that, because that would just not work. But by slashing your sword, you can change your angle in midair. So by running, jumping, and slashing your sword at the perfect time, right as we've crossed these like stones right here, we can land on the invisible walled slope that kind of keeps the bottom and the top layer apart. And we can ride this along to get over to this chest. Now you can see that the game has a harder time to try and figure out where to put you when you're just sliding like this. That's also why we place bombs. So right here, I go here to place a bomb and pick it up. And this will make it so that I'm more kind of hovering instead of doing that kind of a glitchy g -g -g motion I was doing earlier. So now I'm going to try and get as close as I can by just jiggling my analog stick up and left. It's a tiny bit to in of bounds as I can, but still stay on this invisible wall. And if I do it right, the game is going to choose that, oh, the closest place where I can be on a valid wall is this floor right here instead of on the left. Then I can throw the bomb, jump across this gap, and now I can run alongside this. I'm going to stop here and pick up the bomb drop, drop down here, and immediately pick up the boss key. And now we have officially broken most of Dungeon 4. So at this point, we're going to run here. We're going to pick up a small key. And we're just going to pick up as little things as possible to be able to beat the dungeon while still being able to end the flippers. Because we do have to be able to swim to enter certain areas of this game. So it is a mandatory item to get. So let's run through here. Now, you can partially stun lock this enemy right here. Hopefully, I'm able to do it. Okay. You can get, try and get three hits in in the corner here when he's turning around, but it's really precise of a timing. I was only able to get two of them in, but still a pretty fast fight. But either way, we pick up the flippers, and here we're going to save and load and then exit. And we are not going to beat this fourth dungeon until the very end of the game. Because the quest that gets started from beating Dungeon 4 is one of the most restrictive quests. So if that starts, we have to complete it. We can't skip it. So the only way to skip it is to save this dungeon. And now we can get the best song in the game. We're going to stand here and we're going to play the song. Since the game never intended you, by the way, to be able to swim before removing the waterfall, the sides of the waterfall do not have collision, which is why you can just kind of land there. Now, after getting the flippers, I'm going to round down here and this is the dungeon five. So I'm going to swim down here. Now, this is probably one of the few dungeons you're going to see me do, which do not actually use any crazy glitches. So if you want to see just like a very well routed out dungeon without skipping the whole thing, this is going to be your dungeon of choice. So this one, we're just going to try and optimize everything as much as we can while still playing through it, quote unquote, normally. Okay, we're going to go to the left here. There's a cool little jump trick you can do right here. If you stand on this and then do a run jump, you can just barely make it skipping that whole puzzle. So that's a cool little mini skip. Now, right here, we're going to push these two blocks to get a small key. And then once again, in this dungeon, I'm going to be using the autosave feature a lot to backtrack quickly. So I'm going to just get the small key and instantly load that autosave to put me back. This dungeon is quite confusing in a first playthrough because this is the first dungeon that uses backtracking and it's not a straight path, which I know a lot of people online really like when it comes to Zelda games. So now here's the whole main concept of this dungeon. You see on the floor, that there's one blue tile right here. So this skeleton can be in four different areas and you have to fight him in in the correct order so it'll be like one two three four and if you memorize it as a speedrunner you can just run straight to them so you never have to like note it down and backtrack you can also see that i try and preemptively put out a bomb so i don't have to wait for it to explode because i know when he's going to become vulnerable from hitting him so i'm trying to time it to remove any downtime when it comes to waiting here's two out of four We 
We're gonna go to the right there, and that's just to pick up some extra bombs, because I'm sure you've noticed at this point, bombs is used a lot in the speedrun, so we definitely want to get extra bombs. And here's the third skeleton. You can see, like, once you've memorized the route for this dungeon, you can actually make it very fast. Okay, we're gonna load this. And now we finally get to basically where we started this whole thing. Because this is where you start by getting the first small key is also where the game developers put the fourth and final skeleton. So he's going to be played exactly like all the other ones. It is basically a repeat. It's a very strange game design, but it's fun at the same time. Gonna make it go down. And then we're going to pick up the hookshot. Now, once we have the hookshot, we are pretty much ready to beat the dungeon. We're going to go ahead and run and pick up the boss key and then make our way to the end. Now, there is actually one really cool speedrun trick left in this dungeon when it comes to getting to the boss as quickly as possible, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. But first, let's go and pick up the key. Okay, there we go. There's the boss key. Now, normally, to be able to get to the end of this dungeon, you have to get another small key and go through a bunch of kind of underground areas to make it to the very end. But that is very, very slow and not necessary. And this, I don't even know if I'd consider the skip I'm about to do a glitch. I would more consider this to be a clever use of intended mechanics. So you can try this yourself if you want. It's actually not that difficult. I'm going to be equipping my hookshot, have the feather, and then go in here. Now, this game plays like a 2D game, right? So you can only walk in eight directions, right? Up, down, right, left. Up, right, down, left, etc. right? But the game, since it's a 3D game, can register all of them. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to be looking up right, and then I'm going to jump and tap right on my analog stick. Because if you look here, this is the angle I have right now. But if I jump and tap right very gently, I can hookshot this block because it gives me an in-between angle because when Nintendo tested that to make sure that that block wouldn't be accessible, they only made sure that it wasn't hookshotable with the eight normal directions. So if you can get an in-between angle, you can hookshot it from the side. So it's super easy. Now here is the biggest RNG element of the run. This guy can spawn in any corner and you can get as many fake or real one of these as possible. So hopefully we get one that is on the other side and it's not a fake. Oh my God. God, please spawn on the other side. All right. If you can get it all the way from the other side, you want to do this, by the way, because once you've attacked him more, he will have higher likelihood of having a fake head. Because if you do that correctly, then you just need a little bit of damage like that for a short distance to be able to two-cycle him. Hopefully, it doesn't take you too many fake ones. As you can see there, I actually had good RNG on that one. And then that's the boss. And that is the next instrument. A one cycle is possible if you set it up so that you got a double damage drop from the last enemy right before the boss fight started. The drops that gives you double damage or double protection is actually based upon kills and damage, not just completely random. So you can, if you count your kills, set it up so you can have a one cycle there, but it doesn't line up well with this specific route at all. So it's not even really worth going for. Now, once we have all of this we're gonna run to this side and this is where we're gonna get our sixth key now this is one of these bosses that i struggled so much with as a casual i never understood this guy's like one ability window but if you ever want to play this game again you hold up a charge attack jump and then spin attack right as he starts to like move again you can't do it too early and then it's two arrow shots and he's down. So once you memorize it, he's really weak. But as a casual, I died against this guy because I could not figure out how to get his armor off. But once you take him down, you get that. And now I don't need anything else here. So I'm just going to warp away so we can head over to the sixth dungeon. All right, now dungeon six. Unlike when I used to run this game a lot four years ago when it first launched, the newer routes today are some of my absolute favorites. Uh, right here for this basement room, by the way, if you're fast, you can always make it right before this cycle of that bubble enemy right there. So you can just run across. For these wizard enemies, you can use one bomb arrow to take down all three enemies. It's super clean. I love that strat. And then you can go up here and pick up the highest upgrade for the power bracelet. And once you have this one right now, 
the dungeon will be fully open up to you because that's the whole main mechanic is being able to lift these kind of elephant enemies here. Then I'm going to pick this up, run through here. And this room right here gives you some hearts, but more importantly, it gives you 100 rupees. There's something later on that costs 300 rupees. So we try and get them in this dungeon because these later game dungeons just have more rupees. Now here is when like the kind of shenanigans normally would start if you were to play this game casually. You need to do a lot of trial and error and back and forth because you need to enter certain rooms when a switch is either up or down. And if you enter an area and you had it wrong the first time, you might be screwed. Thankfully, if you know how to do it, it's pretty straightforward. Now, I actually want to show you something before I do this glitch. So do you see this door right here? I'm just going to hold straight up and show you something. So the developers messed up and made this an upward slope. So I'm going to just technically line myself up here. And this is so I can drop a bomb to do some more stuff out of bounds. But I'm just going to walk straight forward and I kind of fall into this door frame. Then from here, I'm going to try and drop a bomb and then pick it up while I'm on this wall. So that I'm able to float more up here without falling down. Now, once I have done that, I'm going to be going to the left of this room right here. And you can see on my shadow that I'm slowly kind of going up here. And my objective is to get in the middle of the room where I'm actually standing on top of the barriers around the game. So now I'm at the very top and I am good to go. So I'm going to run down. I'm going to run down. And now we get to our first room here. So here I'm going to try and maneuver out of bounds. And you can see my sword here. It is actually not a lot of space up here. So there's only a very small part of the edge that you can stand on and the rest does not have collision. And if I ever go to an area where I don't have collision, the game can't put me close to where I am. So it'll respawn me back to the original room I went out of bounds at. Then I'm going to walk to the very edge here because there's kind of a weird, awkward, invisible wall that's sticking up. But if I do that setup, I can walk up here. This is the room where the boss is. And then here is the instrument room. So that skips the entire dungeon. And this might look easy, but the out of bounds walks are all very, very precise with precise setups so that you never get stuck with the weird out of bounds shenanigans. Now, once I'm done here with dungeon six, this is when the game really kicks up the difficulty and you have a lot of stuff to do. So in the vanilla game here, you're supposed to go to dungeon seven at the top right, which requires you to do a long side quest to get a blue rooster. Once you've obtained the blue rooster, you go and climb the entire mountain and it's massive trust me and it is a difficult climb to get up so many fake caves it's an absolute troll now i actually will spawn this blue cucko because believe it or not this blue cucko is one of the most broken companion slash items in the entire game now we can go down here to the frog we talk to the frog he wants 300 rupees which we have thanks to the three 100 chests we picked up and then we get our second song now, after getting the frog song, we're going to go back to the village and we're actually going to pick up the last song. This last song is unfortunately necessary to unlock the literal last boss of the game. So you do have to go through this one as well. All right. You can also hear the panic music outside, by the way. That's because we never saved Bow Wow. So since he was never saved, the whole village will be in like constant panic for the rest of the game. But here now, we're going to rescue the blue rooster. Now the blue rooster, you know that like kind of air glitch I did where I can climb that invisible staircase in the air? The rooster basically takes those glitches to the extreme. When you hold the blue rooster, you will float and you can float over things, which makes it one of the most broken mechanics. And that's also why I will not be completing dungeon seven yet i'm actually going to do dungeon eight first just so that i can take advantage of the blue rooster for both of these dungeons but first things first i'm going to reset the camera into position by entering this cave and now here i'm going to try and do a very difficult air climb to the very top here and this is very precise but it's also very easy if you want to try these glitches you know i'm going to learn a difficult staircase one this is very easy i'm going to tap up and then I'm going to pause and see when Link enters his animation of climbing the ladder. Once he does, I'm just going to hold up. And now I'm just air climbing. And now let's see if I can get this. Ugh. What I'm trying to do is right as I get to the very top of the stairs, I have to jump and then move my analog stick like up, upright, right, and then straight down very quickly in a very precise timing to get stuck on top of the invisible wall. And then get to this... 
grass texture, slide on the invisible wall, and now I land here at the top. Now I have to do the weirdest layer glitch imaginable. Basically, I'm gonna try and make it so that the collision is almost disabled on this layer that I'm on right now, this top one. So it kind of has the collision of the one below, but I'm still flying up here. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna walk down and I want to jump off the ledge while holding the rooster and then get exploded by a bomb at the same time. And if I do it correctly, let's see if this works. I will be kind of partially in the ground flying around. And you can see, I'm just going to show you because it didn't work because I'm too far into the ground, that it tries to teleport me to where it thinks it should be, which is down here. So I'm going to try and do this in a very precise timing because I need that guy right there, that enemy, to see me. Otherwise, I'm stuck out of bounds forever. So let's try this again. Okay. So now you saw me, so I'm going to try and stay under the staircase, and then I want to try and take damage by this guy. So now I'm going to fall down out of bounds here and respawn, and hopefully I respawn on the, like, out of bounds ledge by the ladder. And then I'm going to pick up this bird and float on top of this. And now I am on top of this and I am officially at the back entrance of Dungeon 8 because I got hit by the enemy, which kind of pushed me out of bounds, but it respawned me on that ledge because it was taking a valid collision. It just happens to be that valid collision is, you know, not where I'm supposed to be. And this, you can see, is way into the dungeon. This entrance right here, you are not supposed to be at yet. This is halfway through the dungeon. So this, because I had the blue rooster, skips going through the beginning of the Dungeon 8, and it also allowed me to skip getting the mirror shield since I used the blue rooster to get on top of the mountain. So I do not have to get a dungeon item to get here. Now, once I am here, I do have to still be careful because this dungeon, like I said, is very difficult. I'm gonna shoot this arrow to spawn that small key, and then I'm gonna open up this little archway. And now when we have these two small keys, this is actually everything that I need. So I can immediately head to the mini boss of the dungeon. Now, hopefully I get some good luck with this guy's pattern right here. This guy can be very awkward at times when it comes to when he wants to punch. And this guy also has a very difficult window for stun locking him. And if you miss it, then... Then he likes to do this. There we go. And now once I have all of this set up, we are ready for one of the hardest glitches in the run. I have to go out of bounds here three times and then walk on one of the most broken out of bounds collisions in the game. So here we go. It's going to be a similar thing as the last two times. I'm first going to try and do an out of bounds here on this little road like here. Then I'm going to try and go over here. And this is to try and get above this kind of like blue switches right here that is blocking my path. But we can get up here. Now, once I'm here, I have to clip up on the next invisible wall here. And we're going to do this so we can get on top of these rocks. Now, once we're here, I have to again do a out of bounds here to get on top of these blocks. Now, once I am finally here, we have one of the tightest jumps ever. So I have to be on this height on these blocks I'm at right now. And I need to run and jump into the bottom left corner of this map. And the height and timing required to get this jump to work is very precise. So hopefully we can get this first try. Okay. Then I have to very carefully line myself up here. And if I go too far, I will get put back in a bounce because like I said, these walls are not friendly. And we're gonna go left here. We're gonna jump over this door because the door itself has weird collision as well. Then we're gonna walk up here. Gonna walk right here, walk up here. And then hopefully <sighs> jump over there. Walk in here, and we got it. Okay, you can kind of see Link getting stuck on that. If he gets stuck like that for too long, it will put us back to the room where we first started. That was an actual first try, and that skips the entire eighth dungeon. Now, once we're out here, you can see that I'm kind of just on top of, like, the turtle, right? Because I didn't properly open the dungeon. So now I'm going to be making my way over to the seventh dungeon. What I'm going to do right here is I'm going to push out this rooster here to this edge, and I'm going to do the same similar setup that I did earlier, but this time it's 
for a much cooler reason, trust me. So I'm gonna place a bomb, run into the ledge, and then clip down out of bounds here. But this time, I'm gonna do it to fall out of bounds here, walk to the right, and now you're gonna see that Link is walking in the background. Because all of these mountains, for some reason, have collision. So I can run around the massive mountain here with the egg. And then I'm going to walk to this rock and I'm going to try and do a run jump to get back in a bounce. Almost had it there first try. I have to jump because this invisible wall here to, you know, avoid you from going out of bounds also is preventing me from going back in a bounce. So I have to try and get this jump. There we go. And now we're back in a bounce and we skipped all of the caves that you would normally have to go through to get here. I'm going to go over here and now I'm going to be doing a little bit of an intended strat. So this is why you're supposed to get the blue rooster to be able to enter dungeon seven. This area right here has a big kind of an air gap and you can't normally make it over the air gap unless you have the blue rooster. So once you get to this room right here, there would normally be no way to get here without it. And this is the game's way to make sure you don't sequence break. So we're going to go over here and we're going to pick up the seventh dungeon key. That's it. That is officially the final item that we need. Once we have all of that, we are now ready to head towards the seventh dungeon to beat it. Now, the right side of the mountain is still very slow to climb. So I'm going to do a little bit of a climb trick here to make this faster still. Okay. So I'm going to pause buffer for this. I'm going to start an air climb with the rooster. And then I'm going to make sure to pause when I get to the very top. Once I get here, I'm going to do one, two, three, four pauses down. And then just fly straight right. And if I did it right, I'm going to be on top of the invisible wall and get to this part right here. Now, remember earlier I mentioned that the game doesn't like when you're out of bounds. So it will always do everything in its power to put you back in of bounds. Here is the first time I'm going to use it to my advantage. I'm going to make sure that the game knows that I'm on a normal area here. Get the rooster up to the top of this arena. I'm going to fly up. And then when I get to the top here, and this is a short one. I'm going to fly down right, right, up right. And then when I go above this ground, I'm just going to drop the rooster and fall down. And once I fall out of bounds here now, the game is going to be like, oh no, where should we put him? But I remember that I stood on that collision for a split second, so it puts me back up here. And that is all the climbing on the mountains. That skips like probably like 10 or 20 different caves, and it puts us to the very end. And now we're coming up on my officially least favorite dungeon. I'm curious to see which dungeon chat found to be the most difficult, but I found dungeon 7 to be the most difficult when I play this game casually this dungeon has not only a lot of difficult puzzles but also it has switches and if you fall down which you have to at many times depending on which way the switches were it will either let you get access to the next area or not at all and it's all because of this ball you got to bring this ball around if you don't know to break four different pillars because as you break each one of these pillars you're gonna get this little cutscene, and once you have all four of them the top of the Dungeon will basically like drop down one floor, which is how you get access to it. So I'm going to start off by throwing the first two pillars, pretty straightforward. But once I'm at this point, I'm now going to try and speed up the routing a lot. I am going to try and clip inside of the ball. So I'm going to throw it, walk up, walk down, use a bomb to push it and stay inside of it as it's being pushed. Then I'm going to try and line myself up perfectly here with my shield because I want to push it again to the right and it's very awkward to push this. And then by just jumping, I will get through with the ball without having to walk around, which shows me a lot of backtracking, trust me. And then I'm going to hit those three guys at the correct pattern to spawn that chest. And then here, this is normally another massive backtracking. Normally, you'd have to throw this one over this gap. And then you have to walk all the way around, pick up the ball, walk all the way back. And it's just so much backtracking. So we're going to do everything in our power right here to once again avoid the backtracking. So I'm going to stand against this wall, tap a little bit up, walk right, and throw it right there. That's perfect. And then once I have that ball here, I'm now going to stand AFK in this corner and just enjoy my time. Right here is the third pillar, and down here on the right is the fourth pillar. But what I'm going to do here, this is super clever, look at this, this is not even a glitch. I'm going to push this block to the left, and then I can pick it up in the middle there to get it through without having to walk all the way around a third time, which is normally how you would have to do it if this was casual. Then once I've done that, I'm going to walk down with this ball. I'm going to line myself up in the middle of the room. 
forgot to break this wall. I'm going to walk down, and then I'm going to throw the ball right in the middle to land here. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to push this block, and now I'm going to try and launch this ball. So I'm going to line myself up so that I'm right in the middle of this part here. Then I'm going to place a bomb, pick it up, throw the ball on top of the bomb, and walk in and out. And if I do it right, the bomb will push the ball and launch itself across that little gap. Once that is done, I can walk up here, throw the ball, and bam. That is all four pillars without having to do all the backtracking with all of the switches they're used to. Now, once I have this ball here, I want to get back as quickly as I can. And thankfully, there's another quick way to do this. Just walk in and out right here to be inside of this ball. Then do a jump that will push you on top of this invisible wall here. And then jump, hold down. You can get over the gap without having to fall all the way down the back up again. And that's literally it. I've now made it back to the very beginning slash end of the dungeon with the switch in the right position. So that's it. That's the entire thing. Now I can run to the mini boss to get the boss key and and be done with the dungeon. And I will tell you someone who ran this game when the game first launched. This route is so much better. This dungeon used to be like 10 minutes of running back and forth before we knew that you could launch the ball. It was very slow to run around. Even when you have the dungeon memorized where to go optimally, it's still so slow. I pick up the boss key. Nice. Speed up. Here is the final boss fight here. If he does a ground attack, I will actually be able to use my sword really quickly here since I got double damage. So we'll see how it goes. Nice, good RNG. Come on. Ah, unfortunate. All right, well, at least I got one in with the double damage. All right. All right. There we go. Now, you might think that this is the last dungeon we had to do because we used to dungeon eight and seven. However... If you remember what I mentioned before, I said that I could not complete Dungeon 4 because it activates a side quest that is non-skippable. And that means that dungeon is still not completed. And we have to complete all of them for the instruments because otherwise you cannot break the final egg. You know, like some older games, <coughs> OT, <coughs> only looks for, you know, like the last medallions to beat the game. This one does not. It looks for all of them. So we do have to beat this dungeon here. And simply put, so you know what's going on here, there is a ghost that spawns. It's a purple ghost and... And he basically haunts you after you beat the fourth dungeon. And you have to bring him back to his, like, favorite spots so that he can, like, find peace in life. And he's going to keep following you forever until you've done that. And while he is following you, you cannot enter any dungeons, which includes the final egg where the final boss fight is. And that is why we make sure that we do not, under any circumstances, beat dungeon four before the very end. Because we cannot walk into like any section of the main parts of the map without the ghost spawning. So we have to go straight from dungeon four to the final boss fight without doing anything else. Because if we activate any events, then he will follow us and we will not be able to beat the game. You can also see this boss fight by the way here a quick little fun fact this boss fight is one of the easiest fights but believe it or not it used to be so much worse on the original game they just didn't give this boss fight ai so he literally doesn't move he stands perfectly still and you just swim and fight him so this is one of the most changed bosses he's still easy but it's no longer laughable where he's just literally afk with no ai whatsoever he's just standing there like all right attack me all right, well, that's it. That's the final dungeon. All eight instruments have been obtained. I'm going to play this song and I'm going to work to Boris's hut, aka Dampe's hut. Now we're going to go to the end. And if I go at all a little bit down here on the map or left, the ghost spawns. So this is why we had to make sure that we had everything we needed at this point. So we're going to go up here, run up to the very top. I'm going to equip my instrument and here it is. All right, and that's it. Now, if you play this game before, you will know that at this point, I should not be able to beat this egg because you have to get a book and a lens to be able to read the book to know the order for this egg. And it is different in between every single playthrough. Well, people dove into the code of this game when the game launched. So there's a couple of things that get determined when the file is made. So that includes things like the Dungeon 4 puzzle, it includes like how he does certain sound effects in the beginning of the game, and also this egg right here. So by doing a 
hard reset of the console and then making sure that you start the game at a very specific time, you can set up a specific seed on your save file. And that is what we have pre-done before the run started. So by going right, up, left, and then up, 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 we will get to the end and it will be the correct order. So we do not have to get the book because of the RNG manipulation before the run started. And then we get to the end of the egg. We're going to jump down. And once we get to the end now, I have to be full focus mode. This boss is genuinely really hard. I have lost PB attempts here to dying. And even as a speedrunner memorizing it, it is easy to mess up. Trust me. So for first phase, we're going to throw some magic dust on him three times. I'm going to try and make sure that I don't actually get hit by him jumping here. Now, for this next phase here, this is all RNG. So I have to hit him, and there is a small chance he can do a blue ball and a chance he can do a red ball. Red ball, I can damage him back by projecting it backwards. If it's a blue ball, then it will just get shot in different directions, and it won't work. Same thing as in A Link to the Past. So let's see how good of an RNG we get. So far, there's zero blue balls. One, unfortunate. Okay, really good RNG. Now, we're gonna start doing some spin attacks here. And hopefully, we can stun lock him here. Clean. Here, I'm gonna do a spin attack, and then I'm gonna be running into Ganon. Because running into him gets you through his spin attack, which lets you take him down. Here, I'm just gonna stand in the middle. Oh, God. I'm gonna stand in the middle. He's gonna get faster for each hit and just continuously charge up spin attacks. Beautiful. Okay, and now for the last phase, I'm going to take out the bone arrow. Now, I picked up a couple of extra arrows here since this was a no reset run for the commentary. But in a real speed run, you have really have to be careful with your arrow management. So normally, you would have a magic rod here. There's two things that can damage this boss. The magic rod and bow and arrow. Now, in the speed run, if you don't have at least 10 arrows to take this guy down, you will be soft locked because you can't go and get any arrows because it will spawn the purple ghost. And there's no drops anywhere where he doesn't spawn him. And I skipped both the boomerang and the rod, which is the other items to deal damage. But that's it. We can take him down with all of the arrows. And then once we run up the staircase, it is time. Bam. And that's it. That is a full speed run of Link's Awakening on the Switch. Incredible speed run. It's super fun. I mean, you can see how broken the mechanics are if you're able to get on top of a ledge. So let me tell you, am I excited for Echoes of Wisdom when we can spawn objects manually anywhere we want with collision to gain height and trust me there's going to be a lot of content on youtube for that as well i'm going to do a full highlight videos back to back to back of my first casual playthrough i'm also going to be keeping us updating any major glitches that are found as well as speedrun updates so if that's not interesting to you be sure to subscribe thank you so much for watching this video i really do appreciate that if you want to see more awesome content though in the meantime before echoes of wisdom click on the screen right now for the two videos that youtube thinks you're gonna like thank you so much for watching this video and i will see you all in the next one. Later, everybody. Bye-bye.